Delighted to welcome you to our final lunch session. The speakers today, which we asked to do a pretty big lift, um, are uh, going to integrate their takeaways from the lightning talks and organized sessions around the themes uh, with how they explore those themes in their own research. Um, our first speaker, Dr. Torben Rick, serves as the summary co-lead for the stress theme. Dr. Rick is currently the curator for human ecology and archaeobiology at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. Please join me in welcoming our panelist, Dr. Rick. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, I've been tasked with talking about uh, all of the papers and posters and thinking about reflecting on the, on the uh, theme of under stress. And it's a kind of a big topic to, to tackle in a short period of time. And what I try to do is, is lump things under three little sections that I'm going to walk through. The first one is sort of the lens through which I was viewing all of your talks and posters, my own kind of background. And I'll, I'll give a little bit of a cautionary tale in there. Then I'll jump into the second component, which will be talking about um, the, the meat of the, the symposium and talking about the various uh, discussions, themes, the frameworks that people were using. And then finally, I'm going to point to a few future directions uh, at the end that will hopefully, hopefully set us uh, up for the next symposium. So I'm an archaeologist. I think I'm one of about five archaeologists that are here. There's a handful of us roaming around. We definitely live on the boundary of the boundary of the socio-environmental work. Uh, but we are social scientists, and we do have kind of a unique perspective on things. And in my own work, I've been doing a lot of collaborative work with other social scientists, sociologists, and uh, researchers in the humanities from history, as well as uh, biologists, ecologists, resource managers, and, and all of us trying to work towards understanding broad socio-environmental issues. And as archaeologists, we bring sort of a, a unique and, and somewhat abstract perspective to the table. And in my work, we excavate sites like this one you see on the left here, which is called a shell midden. And it's basically an old trash pile. It's all the shells and animal bones and plant remains that people were eating and harvesting out of the local land and seascape and then depositing there. And they give, when you take a bunch of these together, they give you really nice like postcards from the past or snapshots of, of how people were engaged in local ecosystems. And when you piece all those together, they can give you really long-term frameworks for understanding socio-environmental issues and human environmental interactions on long-term time scales that we can then help us to use to understand how we got to where we are today, and most importantly, to enter into discussions about where it is that we'd like to go as a society in the future. And so we've done a lot of work with conservation biologists. I work on the California Channel Islands a lot, and this is one of the species up in the top there that we've, we've been working on, the endemic island fox, which is found only out on the California Channel Islands. It's just been taken off the endangered species list, so it's a species of conservation concern. Um, it's really important, but what, what I think makes it most exciting is that it was most likely introduced by Native Americans from the mainland to the Channel Islands about 9,000 years ago. And then we know through genetic and other analyses we've been doing, people were moving them between islands. When we first started talking about this to a journalist, the journalist said, well, they're just a dog. That's not interesting. The Park Service has wasted a bunch of money on this. And I, I just kind of shook my head and said, no, that's the point. That's what This makes them more interesting and more worthy of conservation concern. But we're constantly dealing with trying to break down so many boundaries and barriers like many of us are today. We're also doing work on the fur trade um, and trying to understand you know, one of the major transitions in our planet where many species of marine mammal were pushed to the verge of extinction. And we can use archaeology to understand what those populations were like prior to the fur trade, what ultimately happened in the fur trade, and then how have they recovered. So we have a lot to say then again about the formation of novel, novel ecosystems and the place of people within those systems. And then also we can use that to kind of decouple uh, natural and human systems. One of the things we deal with and the problems we have, and this is where my cautionary tale comes in, is that we deal a lot with what I call the eraser of time. And in this case, we've messed up in so many places and so many different time periods that you need the eraser for really big mistakes. But what so often happens, and I didn't see it so much here, partly because we were tasked with thinking about socio-environmental issues, but what so often happens when people think about conservation, restoration, ecology, they want to get out the eraser and take people out of the equation immediately, right? You want people out of that framework. And we've been arguing for years now, and I think getting across that we can't do that. It's just not sustainable. So my cautionary note is that we still have boundaries to span and boundaries to, 
to build bridges across, and I think we've seen a lot of that being done here, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And I wanted to bring attention to just one particular paper that just came out last week, and this is by an anthropologist and another collaborator that looked at, this is in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution, and they argued that what we need to do is restore the lost ecological function of people. And this may seem commonplace to some of you, it may seem radical to others of you, but it's a really important to think, thing to think about. We can't just erase ourselves from the landscape. So how does boundary spanning fit into this? In terms of boundary spanning, I was struck by four things that Margaret kind of highlighted in her opening kickoff a couple days ago, which was these four ideas here, the data inaccessibility, lack of access to data. Um, it's difficult to have tools for finding collaborators across disciplines. Um, we need to identify solutions and not just problems. And then focus on research deserts um, not just hot topic areas. And this symposium certainly did all of these things. And so I'm going to kind of draw some of these threads out a little bit um, as I continue this talk. But these are things that I think we still need to, to continue to work on as well. So socio-environmental research, and particularly under that theme of stress, this will come as no surprise. But when I have to think about all of the different talks and, and everything, I can say it's everywhere. I mean, I saw stuff ranging from theology to hydrology maybe mixing theology and hydrology, to <laughs> forest science, you name it, it was there, to archeology, span really we're seeing some really important stuff. And I, I was really excited to be a little bit outside of my comfort zone on many of these talks. And I have to say, if you ever go to a conference and you're forced to sit through one theme and that theme only and sit there, it's pretty revolutionary. You know, usually you're hopping around in a little conference hop thing going back and forth. It was really interesting to sit through all of these different sessions under one theme and see some really intersections over things that I didn't seem to see would think would be very well connected. Um, so there were 23 contributed talks under our theme, 21 lightning talks and 17 posters. I endeavored to get a taste of all of those. Um, extremely diverse, as I said, and I think that's one of the strengths of this is the diversity. And then how we bring that into a synthesis I think remains a little bit of a challenge. I'll try to try to get there towards the end. And I would say also to one of Margaret's points from the first day is that succinct is about synthesis, right? It's about bringing things together. It's about those big core issues. And a lot of these sessions, um, I got the synthesis out of it and thinking about them. And each of them, you know, it depends on what scale you're thinking of synthesis on, whether it's topical or related. But there was synthesis coming out of these. Just to give you that highlight reel of what some of this diversity spanned, under the stress theme, we had talks ranging from uh, getting underutilized fish like the Pacific Grenadier into school lunch programs to help increase nutrition. We saw talks, a lightning talk uh, near and dear to my heart because it's from the Smithsonian on bird friendly coffee and red siskin conservation in Venezuela. Uh, Jerry Jacka gave an outstanding talk looking at climate change, El Nino, and the increase of frost in Highland Papua New Guinea and how that's causing a great deal of food insecurity for people, resulting in migration, increases in violence, and all sorts of interesting cultural and environmental dynamics. Talks like in the sequoias in California where we're looking at long-term drought and that what that's doing to uh, tree mortality. Uh, one of the most fascinating sessions was the one yesterday on emerging infectious diseases, which was a real pick-me-up, to say the least. Um, <laughs> but it did bring together a really interesting look at Zika, at, at Ebola, and fun stuff like that, and how they're deeply nested with human social systems, um, as well as our biological systems. And then today, I, I, I got to catch uh, some of Aaron Wolf's session, which was really remarkable, and this one, um, I'm going to bring up again at the end, got to some really interesting issues about spirituality, about religion, about all of those core things that make us human and how they play into these social environmental systems as well. So we had a talk on water and, and, uh, and, and human behavior in the Nile River, another one about uh, wolf reintroductions in Sweden, the talks on rangelands, uh, urbanization in, in Austin, Sweden agri agriculture by Sean Downey, and then of course a couple talks focused on different hazards, and all of these things come together in very dynamic ways. One of the unifying things I saw in all these topics, and, and one of the things that I, I think was one of the most important kind of synthetic things was one of the challenges that we face, and in my view one of the biggest barriers to interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research is methods. Right? We all get a little bored by methods, but I was really, really excited to see people using some very exciting methods to approach socio-environmental issues in new and unique ways. One of those 
was a, a, a great use of Twitter. You know, Twitter is often kind of depressing when there's a certain orange individual using it. <laughs> but in this case, this was in the emerging infectious disease category where they were using Twitter's geolocation tools to look at disease vectors around the world. And this is giving them much more fine-grained data than they'd ever had before. Of course, some really great uses of GIS layers. Uh, Lori Peake's talk, for instance, uh, 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 two days ago, I guess now at this point, you know, showed the use of GIS and planning for hazards. We saw GIS layers being used in mobile apps uh, to help people get out of, out of tsunami zones in Oregon, some really neat applications of GIS. And then, of course, um, we've got modeling efforts too, so a lot of network analyses going on, a lot of, uh, uh, of different types of models that were being used, uh, agent-based modeling. And this gets back to Margaret's theme, which is that idea of, of data accessibility. And in this case, I saw a lot of promise for how data were being accessed and utilized. We still have a lot of barriers there, but this was a case where I think data were being used in unique ways and made more accessible by technology. Now, future directions to kind of point to, point to uh, uh, new areas to go. Now, these are things that did come out in some of the talks, but they're things that I think we could push even further. The first one is continue to broaden our research and make it even more inclusive. The second one, no surprise from an archeologist, is to think more and more about time, about history, about uh, the, the long-term range of socio-environmental variability. The third one, no surprise from a museum guy, is thinking about audience and impact. And then the final one is about optimism. So just to think about broadening our research and community engagement, Aaron, Aaron Wolf's session uh, just about an hour ago was one that I think really took this in the next direction. That's working with communities, thinking about different ways of knowledge, how all of those things can intersect and give us a much better understanding of socio-environmental systems. And of course, these relate right back to, to natural transitions. This is a Australia, in Australia, indigenous burning practices that have been used for millennia and now being used in, in uh, fire management. Expand your time depth is the other one, is think about longer term. And of course, a lot of you are thinking on decadal and maybe a couple decades, but what happens if you interject century or millennial scale thinking into your work? I think it could really help you span boundaries, help you find a new collaborator, maybe a friendly archeologist, <laughs> right? But I wanted to think about the hazards work, you know, just to point out, there's been work by archeologists thinking about the effects that earthquakes and tsunamis have had on people in the past and the long-term scale that they can have. The, in these cases, you can see some of the resilience of both the natural system and the socio-environmental system. So some really work, I just highlight some Oregon Coast work in Papua New Guinea right here. Then with regard to audience, you know, we've been talking a lot to a scholarly audience, of course. That's what, that's what mostly what this was about, an academic or policy-making audience. I, I work at a museum, though, where we have seven million visitors a year. They're always in my way as I'm trying to get home. And so I think a lot about them, but they're, you know, those are the people we need to be, those are the people we need to be engaging, right? Those are the people that we need to be interacting with and getting them to buy in and think about the social environmental work. And so much of what I think is at the core of socio-environmental research is that we have the ability to put people into the world, right? We're also into ourselves. You know, when people walk through our exhibits and they might see an ocean sunfish, they'll think, cool, but they sure would like to know how it intersects with their life. And so if we can start reaching out to, to both the public and then also, of course, continuing our scholarly dialogues and working with uh, agencies and policymakers, and then, of course, the communities that we work in. And then just a, a little note on communities is we have to be cognizant of, of working with communities, not just as the subjects of our research, but as participants and collaborators in the work that we're doing. And I think that approach is such a, it's very anthropological, of course, I show my anthropology hat there, but it's a way to broaden our research and make it much more inclusive and dynamic. And of course, this thread of audience trails into the impact of what we're trying to have across scholarly and theoretical building, as well as policy and then community collaboration. And then that last note is about optimism. And there was a lot of discussion in the stress uh, theme about reducing stress. And I thought I'd point that these are available online. You can tack them up onto your wall. It's a head banging technique that is apparently there for reducing stress. Joking aside though, one of the things that I think is so important that I would, I would have all of us try to do more of is optimism. And it's bringing optimism out. It's easy to get depressed 
practically every one of us is a pretty depressing doom and gloom person to be around when you really get to the core of what we're doing, whether it's dying trees or polluted watersheds or people without any food, you name it, it's there. But we need to seek out those optimistic stories as well, where the successes as well as the failures are. And this comes right back to Margaret's core theme from early on that's identify solutions and not just problems. And these are the ways to engage people and get that buy-in that's so crucial for success. And I don't mean sugarcoat it, right? I don't mean not give people the hard facts, but butter it up a little bit, right? Maybe a little syrup on top. We had a summit at the Smithsonian, I think it was last year on Earth Optimism, and it was really a car conservation commons group did it, and it was really pretty impactful and something that we're trying to do more of, and I would encourage all of you to do that. And then my final point, I added in late last night, which is always sort of a questionable thing to do, but I was thinking about our lunchtime talk yesterday and thinking that, you know, socio-environmental scientists, all of us, we're under stress too. And I don't just mean the academic stress that we're under or to publish or perish, all of those things, but there's real issues of, of gender bias. There's real issues of racial, racial bias. There's real issues of unconscious bias that we all face and that can be roadblocks not only in our professional careers, but in the research that we're trying to do the policies and changes that we're trying to make. And it's up to all of us to make sure that we try to break down those boundaries as well as the research boundaries. And I think if we do that, we're going to get to a much better future. Thank you. Mm -hmm.